Hi. I'd like you to join me in thanking our new patrons this month. Matt Modzel and Paul Harvey. If you'd like to join them and unlock exclusive content each month, go to patreon.com slash khp. The link will be in the show notes. So, as you can hear, the show got a bit of an upgrade. I was able to purchase a new mic and audio interface with the help of Candace Nola and the patrons of the show. I'm loving this new mic. It's given me the ability to record and edit in the same area, streamlining the entire process of making the show. I hope that you enjoy the quality improvement. As the Patreon grows, the quality of the show will improve, and more content will also be released. Now, enough with that. Let's get into the story and really hear how this new mic works. KHP 008 Sled Path I grew up in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, an hour or so outside of Philadelphia. You probably know it as the place with all the Amish people. I wasn't raised Amish, but I had a lot of Amish friends. They referred to me as their English friend, English meaning non-Amish. I was their small window to the way the outside world lived. On Sundays, after their church and family affairs, I would hang out with a few of my Amish friends for a couple hours. The Amish are usually very strict about letting non-Amish congregate with their families. With my family growing up and me spending most of my free time around them, I was sort of an exception. I think it was just before middle school, so I was in fifth grade when these events occurred. I had sort of grown away from my Amish friends, Amos and Eli, as they had begun taking on more responsibilities as we grew up. Amos had begun learning the ways of farming and how to keep track of sales for his family's farm. Eli was learning how the sawmills that his family owned worked. Our homes were all pretty far apart. Amos's family was on the same side of the road as mine, but a few thousand feet of fields separated our houses. Eli's house was on the other side of the road. His house had a small driveway leading up to his family's large, white-sided house with multiple open-faced garages. Their wagons, drag lines, and tools were stored within. Both of my friends had barns. Amos' family's barn was much larger, as it had cows, horses, goats, and chickens. Eli's was just a stable for their workhorses that dragged logs and timber. We would run through the fields to meet up and play when we had the time. Amos and Eli were only ever allowed at each other's houses, and neither of them were allowed at my house. I knew the rules about avoiding the English lifestyle and knew this was a rule that we couldn't break. I would have loved to have shown them my Atari or toys or anything else that they didn't have as they were Amish. We had been friends for quite a few years, as much as friends could be when separated by restrictive lifestyles. It was during a time when we were over at Amos's barn, threshing wheat and taking the straw left over into the haylofts for the winter. This was a simple task that kids our age could do easily, and gave the adults more time to do other things. It was monotonous and tired your arms quickly, but... It was a good excuse to be around Amos and Eli. After an hour or two of threshing, we stopped for a break, walking to the spring house a few feet away from the barn to get some water. I splashed water on my face and arms, trying to wash the dust from the weed off. A chill ran through me. It was mid-November. Fall had come and was beginning to turn into an early winter. Thanksgiving was coming in less than two weeks. 
The sky was overcast and showed signs of rain, something that we did not want to happen to the wheat in the field we had yet to gather. I bundled up my jacket and filled one of the cups at the spring house. Drinking gulps of the cool mountain water was always a delight. It was leaps and bounds better than the city water I had at home. Amos spoke up as we cleaned ourselves. He asked Eli what he was asking St. Nicholas for this year. He did it in a sort of shorthand speech that made the question sound like, What you asking St. Nicholas this year? Eli pondered the question for a second, putting his straw hat back on his head, and responded in the same shortened speech. I asked for a set of tools. Dad said could learn the fall trees next year if I was good, and St. Nicholas brought me. What you? I asked for a fancy pen and logbook to keep track of inventory and sales better, Amos responded. With a chuckle, Eli said, not getting that. I've seen the way you look at my sisters and the English at the market. You've sinner's thoughts. You get a visit from the bell snickle. A piece of candy if you're lucky, but likely twenty whippings. This caught my ear. I've heard of St. Nicholas, St. Nick, Santa Claus, whatever you want to call him, but I've never heard of this bell snickle guy. What's the bell snickle? I butted in. They both looked at me. A sort of disbelief in their expressions. You know not of the bell snickle? Eli questioned. I shook my head. They glanced at each other, and Amos started talking. You know St. Nicholas, correct? I nodded. The bell snickle comes before St. Nicholas. He wears animal furs from the mountains he resides in, and paints his face dark like fresh tilled dirt. They both looked far off into the hills and the mountains, as if hoping that someone wasn't listening. He comes to children and will decide if they are naughty or nice in character, not by deeds they have done, as St. Nicholas does. For those that are deemed nice, he will give candies or cakes. For those he finds naughty, he whips with the switch he carries. We don't know how he enters homes, but you will know when he comes. Well, have you seen him before? I asked with more of a waver in my voice than I wanted. They nodded their heads and Amos continued. We were given the switch two years ago by the bell snickel. It was very painful and left us bruised for a month. If Amos and Eli were playing a joke, their expressions did not give anything away. Not the slightest hint of a smirk or sly glance to each other. Do you think he'd visit me, being that I'm English and all? I quietly asked. Don't know, Eli said flatly. You've spent many days working with us. You may be considered by the Bellsnickel to be worth judging. With that, the conversation of the Bellsnickel and the upcoming Christmas events were soon replaced with other stories and us getting back to the barn to work. I had forgotten about the conversation with Eli and Amos as time went on. I didn't see them again, as I was on Thanksgiving break at school, and had family gatherings at my parents' and grandparents' houses. We had nearly a foot of snow by Thanksgiving, and it seemed like we were going to have much more than that by Christmas. I enjoyed the snow. Our house was in a large, flattish valley with just enough slope to get going on a sled. During the first snows, once it covered the grass and began piling up, I would create a sled path, one that stayed packed down until the snows melted, because I would ride my sled down it nearly every day, even if I didn't do it for fun, just once a day to make sure that the track was packed and smooth. I also piled up a flat wall of snow, on the side of the track facing Amos's house. The wind would blow large drifts of snow from the field between our homes and cover my sled track. Putting this wall of snow up prevented that for the most part. I would shovel whatever the winds piled up overnight and the school hours and add it to the ever-growing, ever-lengthening snow wall. It was the beginning of December when we had an ice storm. 
The power lines were broken in multiple places from falling trees and the weight of the ice. School was canceled until power could be properly restored. The ice created a nice layer of hard, packed snow that let my sled fly. I was able to nearly double the length of my track by packing down the crusted ice. This also meant that I had to double the length of the wall to avoid covering this new, amazing track. I allowed a small dusting of snow to be on the track, as I found that that let me go faster, getting less friction from the rough bits of ice. It was maybe a week until Christmas. A major snowstorm had just come through the night before. I woke up and looked out my window, seeing small humps on the porch that were our grill and picnic table. The storm had to have put at least two feet of snow down that night. I saw that the road hadn't yet been plowed. I ran down the hallway, still in my pajamas, and turned the TV on to the news. I watched the bar at the bottom of the screen tick by the names of schools slowly. Then I saw my school flash on the list. Closed. I had to wait another 20 or 30 minutes for the bar to show my school again, just to make sure I wasn't seeing things. Yes, closed. I began getting dressed and put my snow gear on. I had a lot of work to do for my sledding path to be perfect again. There was a lot of snow to move and a lot of wall to build. I ran outside and grabbed a shovel and started digging out a trail to my sled path. It took a while, but eventually I made it around the house to the backyard and stopped. Next to the large hump that was my wall of snow was a pathway. Someone had walked straight through the snow on my sled path. I stuck the shovel in the snow and pushed my way through the white powder as if I was walking through waist-high water. A few inches of an indent where my sled path once was was now trampled and ruined. I fell to my knees and I just sat there, the cold breeze flicking bits of snow into my face. I sat for a few minutes, sad that all my time and effort had been destroyed. I walked back and grabbed the shovel, beginning to work on rebuilding my once immaculate path. It took me most of the day, but I was able to build my snow wall higher and pack snow down enough to have an okay sledding path again. I actually improved the sled track by putting a large snow ramp at the beginning. I did think about the tracks, too. Who could have came through our yard? I looked at the direction of the footprints and saw they went in one direction, up the hill. Following them back with my eyes, I found the source. A small, white pickup sat on the side of the road at an angle. It had probably fallen into the ditch on the shoulder and been abandoned during the storm. But why would they have come through the yard and not walk directly to the house for help? After dinner, I decided to follow the path back to the truck, just to look around and see if I could figure out what exactly happened. I walked to my sled path and began walking down the hill. The white truck seemed to be a monument of stupidity for the person who decided to drive during an overnight blizzard. I came close to the truck, an older vehicle that I have seen driven around the area before. The footprints, though, through the snow didn't come from the truck as I had thought. They went to the truck and then across the road to the small clearing near Eli's house. As I got closer, I saw that the windows of the truck were icy, like moisture had built up and fogged the windows, then frozen over. I tried to look into the driver's window, one that was down in the ditch and easier for me to reach. I saw nothing but Wavy, indistinct shapes that were distorted by the layer of ice. I noticed that the handle on the outside of the door was broken off, maybe as a result of the crash. Walking around to the front of the truck towards the passenger side, I saw that the windshield was cracked. There was also a dent in the bumper in the hood of the truck. So, the truck hit a deer in the middle of the storm and crashed. Or did the driver hit whoever was crossing the road. No, that made no sense. The tracks kept going into my yard. If he hit somebody, 
they wouldn't have walked to the hillside behind my house. So who did? I saw the passenger door also had its handle ripped off as well. I climbed into the bed of the truck, to the small, rear window that could be slid open. I used my little fingers to grab and pull on the frozen-over window. Just a crack. Putting an eye up to the crack, I saw clothes. A plaid jacket worn by somebody slumped over the seat. I fell back into the snow that was in the bed of the truck and scrambled to get out as fast as possible. I ran through the snow to my house and screamed for my parents, who quickly got up at the sound of my shouts. I explained that there was a man crashed in the ditch and he was still in there. The police were called and, after about an hour, a large front loader came down the road, filling its massive bucket with snow and dumping it onto the side of the road. I saw a couple of cop cars and police officers around the truck. The cops took a bar and smashed the window and stopped, looking at what was inside. An ambulance soon came after a while, and I saw them wrap a large, gnarled figure on a gurney and take it away. The man was probably frozen solid in that slumped-over position. A police officer talked to me. He asked if I saw anything strange. I told him about the handles of the truck doors and about the strange tracks across the fields. His eyebrows raised at that, and he asked me, those weren't your tracks? And I shook my head. Two police officers were sent to follow the tracks through my parents' yard to the forested mountain behind our house. They came back as dark was approaching to say that they hadn't found anything. I was back at the truck, standing a few feet away from it, the inappropriate angle that it sat at, as well as its white. This stood out more against the now partially drifted shut road. I heard a tapping coming from the truck. I walked down into the ditch and stood beside it. The tapping was louder. Tap, 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 tap. tap. It sounded like a fingernail on glass. I stood beside the driver's door. The glass window was frozen over still. The tapping came from it. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap. I could see it vibrate every time the tap happened. I reached up and tapped back the rhythm that it had tapped out. The tapping stopped. Then a loud bang rang in my ears as the glass shattered, and arms reached out to grab me. The arms belonged to an old man with a scraggly, dirty beard. Animal furs covered him like clothes, and he yelled at me in some language that I didn't understand. He had a hold of my arm and pulled me into the truck. As I hit the floor of the vehicle, I hit the floor. My eyes opened. I was lying on my bedroom floor. I had a bad dream and rolled out of bed. A sigh of relief escaped me as I untangled myself from the blankets and stood up. I heard one of my parents walking down the hall, a soft knock before the door cracked open, shining a hallway light into my room. The shadowy figure of my father peeked in and asked if I was okay. I nodded and said that I had had a bad dream and fell out of bed. I could tell he was holding back a small laugh, but I could hear in his voice he was grinning wide at my predicament. Climbing into bed, the mattress felt cold, as if I hadn't been lying on it for a while. I must have been nearly falling out of bed for most of the night. I covered myself up, but just couldn't seem to get warm. I tossed and turned and curled into a ball. Nothing helped. It was as if that icy grasp of the man from my dream was still chilling me. Wind howled across the fields outside, hitting our house. Small, hard flecks of ice and snow pitter-pattered against the window. It reminded me of the tapping in my dream. Soon, I woke up to the sun streaming through the window into my bedroom. It was Tuesday. School would be let out on Thursday for Christmas break until after New Year's. I looked outside and saw another few inches of snow had fallen, not enough to warrant a school closing, though. I looked out across the road and saw Eli tramping through the snow to the stables to feed the horses. No movement from Amos's house could be seen, though, as it was much further away. I went to school that day. Mr. Marsh was my teacher, a man in his thirties. 
It was his first year at our school, and we were his first class. He had slightly tanned skin and always wore Hawaiian patterned shirts. He had a short mustache that connected to a small goatee, making him look reminiscent of a villain from a movie whose secret lair was in a tropical island. He was a cool teacher, saying common slang and just being down to earth. I enjoyed him teaching, even though I was doing horribly in math. When we were going to line up for lunch, we all saw a lady step inside the classroom. Everyone in the school had seen her at some point. She was someone in the administration, above the teachers, maybe even above the principal. This admin lady was wearing a light purple sweater and black slacks with dress shoes. She looked me in the eyes and then looked at Mr. Marsh. He stood up from his desk and announced that everyone would be going to lunch and they would be directed by... I don't remember the teacher's name, but it was one of the ones across the hall from our classroom. Mr. Marsh looked at me and asked if I could stay behind. Mrs. Roptak wanted to speak with me. I nodded and stepped out of line, and sat in a chair that was already set out for me. Another chair, designed for children, was set a few feet away, on the other side of the desk. Mrs. Roptak situated it and sat down on it. Mr. Marsh sat at his desk in the middle of us, only a desk separating me from him and him from Mrs. Roptak. Mrs. Roptak wasn't a mean lady. She didn't have a sour face or speak with malice. She was a nice lady, a guidance counselor. She had curly brown hair and a smile on her face. She made sure to make eye contact with me and be friendly. Her and Mr. Marsh asked me questions that I thought were a bit weird. Was I feeling okay? Did I have any bad dreams? Was I seeing things that were weird when I was awake? Am I having a hard time forgetting about what I saw the other day? Were the police nice to me? Were my parents being nice to me? Looking back, I now know that they were checking on my mental well-being, making sure that I wasn't traumatized by finding a dead body by myself. I had seen dead things before, living next to a farm and helping out on it. I had seen chickens hit by cars, cows that had died of some sort of ailment and I didn't know what it was, calves that were stillborn, and many other things like that. It didn't strike me as odd that finding a dead body somewhere was supposed to be traumatic or mentally straining. I thought it was just part of everyday life, and I had just stumbled upon it by accident. After about 15 minutes of questions, Mrs. Roptak got up from her chair, as did Mr. Marsh. They told me that they would escort me to the cafeteria, and that I could take as long as I needed for lunch. One of the adult hall monitors that also watched over the kids in the cafeteria would take me back to Mr. Marsh's class when I was done. I ate my food, and a few of my friends asked me what the heck was going on. I just told them it was about the guy that I found in the truck outside of our house. I didn't lie or sugarcoat it. I just told them the truth of what happened. They were a little weirded out, but believed me. Seeing Mrs. Roptak must have convinced them that something major must have gone on, or that I was in big trouble for something. I went home and had dinner with my parents that night. They were super nice and had bought me a new game for the Atari. Adventure. They called it an early Christmas present. It was really fun and a great addition to the games I already had. I spent the day playing my new game and enjoying the afternoon. I got ready for bed and laid down. I couldn't sleep for some reason. I just laid in bed, staring at the ceiling for what felt like hours, when I heard something. I sat up in bed to try and get a better sense of direction for where the sound was coming from. There it was again, coming from my bedroom window that faced Amos's house. I got out of bed and walked to the window, the blankets still surrounding me like a large, heavy robe. The weather wasn't bad tonight. A light wind pushed wisps of snow across the field, almost like white snakes that were slithering towards the house. The moon was out and lit the area well when it wasn't behind a cloud. The snow reflected most of the light, allowing me to see quite far. 
I heard the noise again then. It sounded like footsteps crunching through the extra cold snow. I pushed my face up against the window and looked outside hard for anything that could be causing the noise. I saw a figure step out into view that was obscured behind one of the corners of the house from my window. He was crossing my yard and stepping on my sled path just as the moon dimmed behind a cloud. The crunching emanated from his boots on the snow. The man was dragging something behind him, a sled of some sort. I couldn't make out many details about the person, but he had a heavy jacket on, making his shape look bulky and strangely shaped. Tendrils of cloth hung down from his arms and waist, making him almost sway in the breeze that crossed the fields. His sled had a few boxes and bags on it. I couldn't really tell. My breath caught in my throat as the moon brightened the field again. The man seemed to be the one in my dreams, the one that grabbed me in the truck. He was covered in animal furs and had a long beard that I could see peeking out from under his clothing. He turned suddenly facing me, and began walking towards the house. I gasped and ducked down under the window, peeking up after a second to see him approaching my window directly. My chest tightened and I scrambled across the floor, clawing and dragging my blanket with me. I snaked my way under the bed, out of sight of the window. I sat there, my breath shaky, my hands trembling. I heard the crunching of his boots getting louder as they came towards my window. That sound was all I could hear as a shadow appeared on my floor. He was looking inside my room. I could hear his heavy breaths against the window. Then, tap, 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 tap. The tapping started. The same tapping I heard in my dream was happening against my window. I shuddered as my mind flashed to the man pulling me into the window. Then, I had another flashback to a few weeks ago. Eli, Amos, and I sitting at the spring house, a man in fur that comes before Christmas. Was this the bell snickle? Coming to give me a whipping for being bad in character? Tap, 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 tap. The tapping continued, the breathing as well. I heard a gruff sort of snort before the shadow began to descend as the bell snickle walked away from my window. A heavy breath escaped me and I slowly crawled out from under the bed. I looked outside and saw the man walking through the yard and towards Eli's. I got into bed and continued staring at the ceiling. I don't know how much sleep I really got, but it felt like none. At school, we had a few tests that would be our last for the marking period. Then we would watch Christmas movies for the remainder of the day. I struggled to stay awake during these tests and most likely did horrible on them. Mr. Marsh noticed this and asked me to come with him to Mrs. Roptak's office. I was scared. Being taken to the place I'd only known bad kids to go to. Was I a bad kid? No. I just didn't sleep the night before is all. We arrived at Mrs. Roptak's door and knocked. She opened the door with a smile and looked at me and asked me to sit down in her room. She and Mr. Marsh chatted outside for a minute before she came back in. She asked me why I wasn't sleeping at home. I told her that I was just excited for Christmas and just couldn't sleep. She asked about snacks and sodas and stuff I ate before bed. I hadn't really had any of that stuff. She asked if I had any bad dreams. I nodded and she asked me to tell her about them, which I did. I told her about the man in the truck and how he appeared outside my window. I told her I wasn't dreaming about him coming to the window, though, but I don't think she believed me. She told me to go back to class, and if there wasn't important classwork going on, I could sleep through the movies. I thought that was great, as we had already done all the tests for the day. I slept through most of the rest of school and went home. That afternoon I saw Amos and Eli at Eli's farm and went to meet them. We went to the hayloft in the stables to stay warm. It had been over a month since our talk at the spring house. We chatted about school, the farm, the lumber company, and local gossip that we heard. 
Eli asked if anyone knew about the English guy found dead in the truck. I told him that I found him and ran to get my parents. Eli looked sort of uncomfortable. He said that the Bellsnickel had visited him that night. He thinks that the man swerved to avoid hitting the Bellsnickel and crashed. I said that I saw footprints going through my yard to the hills behind the house, and the trail seemed to lead from Eli's to there. Amos looked a bit frightened. We both looked at him for some sort of dismissal or affirmation. He sighed and said that he had been visited as well. He lifted his shirt, and I could see welts and bruises all over his back. He said that the Bellsnickel woke him a few days ago by whipping him. Two of his sisters also got whipped. They suggested that the Bellsnickel would be coming for me next if he was looking in my windows. I didn't like the thought of that. I asked if there was a way to stop or slow down the Bellsnickel. They simply said no. Unless he doesn't visit you before Christmas, after St. Nicholas comes, the Bellsnickel goes into hiding until the next year. Christmas was in three days, so I just had to somehow avoid him for two more nights. That night was filled with dread. I jumped at every noise I heard, every creak that the house made. I must have dozed off at some point, because I woke up to a tapping sound on my window. I jolted upright and looked, only to see that it was snowing out. The wind made the siding of the house rattle. I got up and looked out my window. Not able to see much further than a few feet because of the snow and the darkness, just outside of my window were footprints leading to and from the field. The bell snickle had been watching me sleep. How long had he been there? I heard a squeak from somewhere in the house and turned around quickly. It was not a quick squeak of something shifting, but a low, slow, groaning squeak. It sounded like a door opening slowly. I placed my ear on the door and listened. I could hear footsteps somewhere in the house. He was inside. I pushed the button on my doorknob, locking the door. I took my blankets and hid under my bed. The heavy footsteps became louder, definitely that of someone wearing shoes or boots. They went up to my door and then down the hallway. I heard my parents' door open and close. Then, I heard nothing. I fell asleep under my bed. The last thing I remember was listening for any sort of sound that would tell me that someone was moving in the house. The sunlight in my room woke me up. My door was just barely open, the lock undone, giving me the smallest smidge of space to peer into the hallway. I got up and went into the kitchen and saw my parents eating lunch. I looked at the time, 11.34. School was closed today as we had been let out for Christmas break. I checked the yard and, yep, another eight or nine inches of snow fell last night. Last night. The footprints. I ran to my room and looked out the window. Smooth, untouched snow sat outside my window. It had begun drifting into a large ramp, nearly to the sill. There was no sign of the man, the bell snickle. At least I had survived another night without being beaten. I played in the yard that afternoon. My sled trail was gone. Only a small mound of snow jutted up from the flat plain of the yard. The bell snickle had walked through it enough that there was no point in trying to repair it. Instead, I headed up towards where the bell snickle's tracks had come from. I went to the side of a forested hill beside my house. I carried a shovel and dragged my sled behind me as I trudged. Once I reached a spot suitable for a sledding trail, I began working. After about an hour, I had a decent sled path that was about 200 feet long. I had just taken my 20 or 30th run on my path when I heard a twig snap. My head shot up towards the sound. Another twig. Snap! It seemed to echo off the trees and the snow around me. I didn't waste time. I ran and jumped onto my sled at full speed zooming down the path and smashing into the unpacked snow at the end. I jumped up and grabbed my sled and shovel and began running towards the house. The entire time I felt like someone was right behind me, 
chasing me through the snow. When I arrived at the back door, I dropped what I was holding and ran inside, locking the door and looking out the windows. There was nothing. No sign of someone behind me. No footprints in the snow besides my own. Maybe I overreacted, but I wasn't about to take any chances. I took off my snow pants and heavy coats and went to my room to play some games to get my mind off sinister things and onto more happy thoughts. Christmas Eve was tomorrow. I should be excited. My mind was distracted for a few minutes, but kept returning to the thoughts of tonight. The last night I had to keep the bell snickel away, as St. Nicholas would be coming the night after. I stopped playing my games and stood up to go grab a snack. As I was grabbing my snack, I began formulating a plan. Hiding under my bed and locking my doors seemed to work. Pulling my curtains shut and barricading myself in my room might do the trick tonight. Something in my mind had told me I'd be safe, but a part of me thought that it wouldn't be enough. Night came, a blustery, moonlit darkness that blew bits of snow against the house and the windows, causing constant noise in my room. I laid awake, waiting for some sort of sign that the bell snickle had arrived. I heard my dad snoring from his room down the hallway, and assumed that my mom was also asleep. I crept from my bed and looked under the crack in my door. A light was left on in the kitchen at the end of the hallway. As I was thinking that the light would be an easy way to see someone coming down the hall, I heard it. Tap. Tap, tap. Tap, tap, tap. Tap, tap. Tap. I turned slowly from the door to look at the window. The silhouette sat, partially obscured by my curtain, but illuminated enough by the moonlight to know that he was there. He whispered my name. Chris. He ended it with a hiss. Then he ducked out of view. I tried to calm my nerves, but my hands started shaking and my breath became irregular. I grabbed my blankets and crawled under my bed. I had piled boxes, toys, and anything that I could get my hands on along the sides of the bed, leaving one way in and out. I had a long walking stick that I was prepared to defend myself with. I waited, listening for any noise outside of my little fort. I listened closely for crunching snow, breathing, doors creaking, or footsteps in the hallway. All that I heard was the sound of the wind battering the house and the bits of snow tinkling against the glass of my window. I opened my eyes. Daylight looked like light at the end of a tunnel from under my bed. I listened. I heard movement in the house and the voices of my parents from down the hallway. I waited for a few minutes to make sure that what I heard was actually what I heard and not a trick, before crawling out from under the bed and standing up. Sitting on my nightstand was a woven basket made of small, green twigs. Set on top of a bed of dried grasses and leaves were neatly wrapped homemade cakes, breads, and cinnamon buns. Scattered amongst these pastries were little candies wrapped in paper. A note was placed on my pillow. It looked to be a large piece of birch bark. Written in scrawled handwriting was a letter addressed to me. Chris, wanted to give you your gift for being so good in character. Sorry it took so long. Had a hard time finding a way in. Thanks for making those walking paths for me. Signed, B. I hope you enjoyed my story. If you want to support the show, Rate and review the show on iTunes or wherever you listen. For extra stories and exclusive content, go to patreon.com slash khp. A link will be in the show notes. Thanks for listening.